When Ryan says when it's time to begin, it's on the rewind around with John Pollock and waiting the A team that makes sense of these things we see in the ring every week on TV. It's rewind around for Monday night, then load a Tuesday morning from the post wrestling site. It's rewind around for Monday night on USA now on the John and Way take the mic. It is Monday. The day after. Hello, everybody. It's John Pollock and waiting with you on a special Tuesday edition of Rewind to Raw live from Toronto. How are you, Way? I'm doing well. Yeah, thank you for accommodating um, the, the request to delay the show till Tuesday afternoon. I, I mean, I really just kind of hit a wall on Monday. So um appreciate the, the, the wait, everybody. You know, sometimes uh, wrestlers out there are like, um, you know, they'll be at the end of some incredible stretch and the end they're like yeah my, my knee's bothering me and then they they look in there they're like dude your your knee is like completely shot like how much were you going on i feel that was way on monday night that was uh like you were mentally just taxed by the end of the this this particular week yeah i mean um that you know it probably a combination of the travel and just you know the constant uh, stream of uh, wrestling and content and recording and and all that so bound to happen um to anybody but you know thank you for accommodating john it gave me the opportunity to watch two episodes of raw last night so that was uh that, that was what i did uh 22 oh. years apart but nonetheless <laughs> because we will be talking about a 2002 episode of raw later this week which i seriously did not know when i was gonna have time to watch this thing so you did uh provide that opportunity for me to watch like <laughs> five hours of raw on monday night i mean how else to come down from a uh a wrestling heavy weekend than uh watching um boy dude do i have thoughts on that 2002 raw you want to just talk about 2002 raw instead today or sure no, why not no other news no you gotta you gotta uh pony up for that one post wrestling cafe you think we're taking it easy this week we got ufc 300 week we're going back to watch hogan and rock a legendary segment to set up their wrestlemania and then an even more legendary follow-up that is beyond insane the follow-up to this i knew i remember this being <laughs> god awful the follow-up to this but re-watching this was just i was on sensory overload of watching this so this is going to be a very fun review as we chat about the february 18th 2002 edition of raw and Sometimes you and I will guess why did this particular um, espresso executive producer choose this episode? And all I am going to assume as a hint for hardcore rewind away listeners, why this person chose this episode of Raw is the famous what you're going to do coming up <laughs> this week, a special Friday release of rewind away. Um, I actually, I actually have to go out of the city on Thursday for a funeral, so I will be away all day long on Thursday. So Friday, um, we are coming back big and bad with Rewind to SmackDown with Way and Neil Flanagan on the cafe. We will have a Rewind Away show, and MCU Later will be dropping this week, and that's just a preview of the weekend ahead. Windy City Riot with Karen Peterson and Bruce Lord, John Cena and Kate. Back on Saturday night with Collision Course. We've got the NWA coming together on Sunday night and a UFC 300 review with myself and Jack Wanon happening Sunday morning post pro res. Dude, we, if, if you saw to knocked on our door and looked at our post schedule and our schedule had to take a urine test, dude, we'd be banned for four years. That's how much we're firing on all cylinders and then some this week at post wrestling. Can you tell I'm on coffee number two? I can tell there's a different energy about um, 12 p.m. Tuesday, John Pollock, compared to 12 a.m. Uh, Monday, John Pollock. You you want to get to my core, okay? You just send that comment, man, you guys sound tired, okay? That that just <laughs> destroys my soul. I'm ready. I'm coming out yeah. aggressive today. All right, all right, let's, let's get it. Let's get into it, and let's get it. Yes, let's go. Well, you're going to get it on Wednesday night, that being the footage from Wembley Stadium at All In last August, and Tony Khan was interviewed. This interview just went up with Justin Barrasso of SI.com discussing the all-in backstage footage and Tony Khan confirming, uh, stating, quote, AEW has a great track record on delivering what we advertise, and it is real footage. 
He said the Young Bucks will show backstage footage from All In, the most important event in AEW history, the world record holder for the most tickets ever sold for any wrestling record, over 81,035 total, and it was an important night backstage as well. He goes on to say, state the decision is based on putting on the best show for AEW, as well as driving interest for Dynamite and our Dynasty pay-per-view on April 21st. This is real-life footage that affected many people, and it will air for the first time on TBS during Dynamite, and ending it with the Young Bucks are wrestling for the world tag titles at AEW Dynasty against longtime rivals FTR. Their rivalry is one of the most significant ever in AEW, and there is a good reason why the Young Bucks are showing this video. So, I mean, clearly they are aiming to garner a lot of interest for Wednesday show, as we have noted, like the last two weeks, it, it, while, you know, they, they have performed well by their competition. Those nights, it has been very low numbers by dynamite standards. Do you think way that this is something that is going to, at least if for nothing else result in a boost and, and curiosity for people to tune in and see this footage is this, is this really in the bubble? Like, yeah, are we going, what, what do you expect on Thursday afternoon when we see these numbers and what it says about the interest of this footage? I think it'll be strong. Yeah. I think, um, even if, um, you are, um, I, I mean, uh, I think the bubble when it comes to this story is, is pretty big, you know? Um, and this is the type of thing that I think will, it, it's, it's a stunt of, um, I don't know, wild, proportions you know the the type of which will garner enough interest from anybody who's even heard about the story so i think it'll do really well but um the it, it, I, I don't think it that really matters as much as how they will capitalize on the attention to draw people back in you know and, um, using this to hook people towards uh checking out dynamite maybe for the first time in a while um, could be, you know, it, it will be effective, but will it leave a lasting impression of any sort to draw enough people to return the next week and then the week after? That's all that really matters. Yeah, I think everyone has weighed in on thoughts going into this. And I think most people are, okay, let's, let's see how this is presented. And if you can adequately parlay this into business, great. That is, that is the goal of any type of, um, angle that's the goal of any type of stunt is how can we translate this, this to business and we'll see what happens on wednesday night so we will discuss it further uh coming up on wednesday but we have a, a bunch of news and notes to get into uh first of all let's start off with a uh, vince mcmahon of course um selling off more shares of his tko stock and this time it is not just being um you know, when when Mark Shapiro had spoken last month about, you know, we're not in conversations with Vince. We don't know what he's doing with his stock. Well, in this instance, uh, TKO and Endeavor, by extension, were involved in this uh, stock repurchase where Endeavor is buying over one point six million of his shares for one hundred and forty two point six million dollars, while TKO is buying over one point eight million for an additional $150 million, meaning McMahon is clearing about $293 million for this sale. And um, Brendan Thurston had a update that he estimates that Vince's shares are now at about just over $8 million and under 5%, which could come into play in the sense that once you are under that 5% threshold, there is less disclosure that needs to be made uh, public in terms of his transactions. So we might not be getting as any transparency regarding uh, Vince's, you know, if there are chairs now that are being dispersed, my understanding is that there, there will be less um, uh, filings, uh, at least public ones. Um, so we will see how that impacts things. But regardless, it does tell you that there was a, um, you know, business transactions here between Vince McMahon's side and TKO Endeavor instead of Vince just acting independently and continues to pile up his liquid cash that he has on hand uh, of well over a billion dollars. So, I mean, other, other than going to shop at the world, I don't know what he has all this money in stock for. I mean, this is, um, we will see what he's going to do with over a billion. Like, what would you do with it with a billion dollars? Just like, hmm. you know, under your mattress. Um, I would, um, uh, maybe use it to, um, get a, you know, nicer mattress, um, perhaps maybe one of those, um, orthopedic ones, you know, the ones that recline perhaps, 
yeah i mean you, you could probably get full-on spinal surgery done for that amount rather than just bother you with could a... probably buy an android's body and implant your brain um so that you know maybe this you could live forever which would be a bit of a nightmare uh when it comes to this guy uh what i mean whatever like this the guy's retiring or he's retired um what what use is it to hold on to stock um at his age you know versus just having the cash who knows what he might have planned? Maybe he just wants to sleep on the, the, the giant pile of money or maybe whatever. Like, you know, so whether or not like it gets reported anymore, um, if it does go below, below 5%. At this stage, what what is the relevance of a Vince McMahon, at least in relation to, to WWE business? Like, what is the relevance of Vince McMahon? I mean, at, at this point, he's still a shareholder. So he still has a, a very four point something percent. Yes. So, I mean, he still has that. I mean, it would be, I guess, just significant if he ever completely divested himself of TKO stock and was fully detached from the company. He is as detached as he's ever been in his lifetime, mm -hmm. especially coming out of this weekend. And this is his lone link to his life's work is now this 4.7%. Yeah. And that's so, I mean, when there, when there's a dividend payout, he will benefit from that. Um, but like his power is gone. Um, there's, there's none to be had at this point beyond having a minimal amount of company stock with, you know, effectively no zero voting power attached to it. WWE and TKO, they put out a press release touting the success of this past weekend's uh, set of shows. And we got the usual WWE breakdown of percentages rather than strict numbers. But the gate for WrestleMania broke the previous set by WrestleMania 39. So let's put that into context. When they say the gate record, they're combining last year's two nights of WrestleMania. The single night record going into this weekend was $17.3 million set at AT&T Stadium in 2016 for WrestleMania 32. Now, um, they reportedly broke the, that record both nights. Um, they stated that this record is up, this weekend's gate was up 78% over last year's as well. And the event drawing uh, from all 50 states and 64 countries worldwide. They also stated that WrestleMania's viewership was up 41% across both nights versus last year's record setting attendance. And I would alert people to uh, Brandon Thurston because we do have a 1.5 million number attached to the 2022 WrestleMania. So if you go to last year and that percentage increase, you can get to a number and then guesstimate where they are when you add 41% off of last week, last month's or last year's uh, percentage as well. They never make it easy for you. It's not as though, I don't know, especially with the gate. Like, I don't know why we would just not release the gate figure. It's the two biggest gates, not in the history of WWE, in the history of professional wrestling were set. The two most financially successful wrestling events in history were Saturday and Sunday night. I would just announce the gate. Why do we have to play the 78% game? What sounds more impressive to you? I would just put, you know, we're, we're talking about probably in the neighborhood of just under $20 million uh, per night. That is an astounding figure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of things that go into um, this sort of Wall Street communication, or maybe um, reactions to a percentile. Um, just is a bit more, I don't know, digestible for that audience. Well, they also added, um, you know, they they plugged the the merchandise uh, being up through fanatics. Um, the WWE World at WrestleMania calling it the highest grossing, most attended fan event in company history. Um, just doing the eyeball test. <laughs> I, I have never seen so much WWE merchandise surrounding an event. And I've been to many WrestleManias. Um, this was another level. I ran into probably 200 world champions on the street. As is the case, usually, um, for these sort of events. Yeah. And then the final things here... Um, touting that SmackDown at the Wells Fargo Center, the largest gate in SmackDown history, Raw being the largest gate in Raw history. And that's noteworthy because last week they had mentioned that 
the Raw going into Mania was the largest domestic gate for Raw. This press release is just stating largest Raw in history. So that would encompass worldwide uh, Raws, like ones that they've done in the UK. And that uh, Stand and Deliver, they're calling the most attended ever um, with the 16545 number that they announced on the broadcast as well. So, I mean, it was a super successful weekend for the company. It has got, it has generated a lot of mainstream coverage, both going in and coming out of the show. And I would say we're going to get into this episode of Raw. It feels as though that momentum is not going to die down. They have a lot of interest in the product. It's almost as though the the ethos that is being espoused on the programming is our company's on fire. Like that's the mission statement essentially is like we are on fire. Look at how much business we're doing. And that's that is what is being um, reiterated on the programming. Like we are telling you, this is a hot product and we have the numbers that are supporting that statement. As they should. I mean, they're trying to, you know, build um, obviously um, constantly interest in the, in the stock. Uh, they're trying to, you know, announce the arrival of a new regime that is, um, ha has brought this company to great heights. Um, and when you're hot, you should be telling the entire world that you're hot. All right, let's move on to a few other notes because I know a lot is uh, going to be focused on uh, tonight's or last night's edition of Raw. Mick Foley, we had spoken about this, and he is pulling the plug on his plans for one final match. He put up a video and stated uh, as well with this message, with my symptoms of dizziness and lightheadedness and consultations with two different doctors pointing to a concussion, I have decided to call off my quest to have a final match on my 60th birthday. I am really grateful to all of the great stars who expressed great interest in being in that final match, some of the biggest in the business, and to all of you who wished me the best. So in the video, he had stated like he had only done some light training and was getting concussion symptoms. And that was something that we had actually spoken about was when he when he after he was told to retire by wwe and they this was when they were going to launch a program between him and john moxley in 2012 and then foley was not medically cleared and they were not going to put him in a match situation any longer and mick talked about his final matches um in tna and that he was getting concussions without even direct damage to the head like he would take bumps and they would just rattle the body and cause concussions and the fact that you know he had you know relatively light training um and he was having this i'm glad that he had the people around him and came to the conclusion that this is not the best idea for me and this is probably the wisest choice that your body could not be telling you any more clearer and that's you know, something that you need to listen to when you have head trauma and susceptible to concussions. And Mick has had, I can't imagine what the total number is, but the documented amount that he has had alone is, you know, it's, it would be cause for concern with all of this. It's concerning to hear, you know, to, um, just even in, in trying to do any sort of light training, he's, uh, like his body's in this sort of fragile state. Um, I mean, in many ways you, you look at that and say, uh, we thought it'd be a lot worse for Mick Foley by this age. Um, but, you know, certainly um, his ambition to have a, a final death match or any single match at all at age 60 um, I, it was met with a lot of concern. But, I mean, I tended to look at it also with equal um, concern as well as admiration for somebody who wanted to lose weight and get his life back on track and using this thing as motivation. So I now that he doesn't have this goal, I hope he's able to find that motivation some some other way. Um, maybe maybe a nice leisurely swim. Um, uh, you know, um, he maybe aim to do 60 laps in a row for 60th birthday. That's that would be kind of nice. So I hope he, he loses that weight and, and finds that motivation some other way. Maybe he can do the CN Tower climb next year. I don't know. I don't, I, I, I mean, sure. Yeah, he can, um, he, uh, he could join our team. Open spot if he so chooses. Postwrestling.com slash WWF. We're looking for donations. Yes, we are. Uh, Way and I will be making our second attempt at the CN Tower climb next weekend. I think it is. No, it's the day of dynasty. That's is a that week from weekend? the Saturday. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Okay, I better start coming training. up. Coming up soon. Matt Hardy has become a free agent, according to Fightful. Um, 
he had disclosed on his show that he had been offered a contract by AEW and was weighing his options and has obviously decided he has he has not signed and therefore is technically a free agent. Do you have any thought on what is next for Matt Hardy and could you see him in, in a coaching role? Do you do you see him getting a, a contract, a wrestling contract with one of the major companies? Hmm. Obviously, AEW was interested, but the terms yeah. were not. Uh, Matt did not want to go, at least with that current contract, is opting not to sign it. Yeah, um, as a full time wrestler, is, is is your is that what you're asking? Could you see it being a wrestling contract, or do you see him if he wants to have a full time role that it would be a behind the scenes coaching type of role? I think that's very possible. Um, I think uh, at this point, I don't really see him getting a, a, any sort of WWE full time contract. Um, as a potential backstage producer, I don't even know if he's had that experience or really even that ambition. But I, I don't. The randomest people seem to get those opportunities. So who's to say Matt Hardy can't? I would actually be very interested to see if he would consider a return to Impact or TNA. I should say, you know, that is still arguably the the, the place of his greatest um, post WWE career success. And I think the, the combination of like Matt Hardy returning to Anthem alone would would generate some headlines and an interesting possibility uh, especially for you know a, a space where matt hardy might actually be treated you know to to the level that i think he wants to be treated as um because certainly during his aew run uh, it, it, it it was a very lackadaisical run you know between mm, um matches that just simply weren't that good we were, all remember that concussion um match with uh with sammy Guevara to just, you know, really not being featured in any sort of significant storyline um, to not really being featured on TV, period. Um, I, I'm sure he I, probably doesn't look back on, on the run too fondly and uh, maybe feels like he has more to offer this business creatively um, as an on-screen character. John Cena was on Pat McAfee's show on Monday. They were taping this at The World. And the key stuff is that he is looking to complete his in-ring days in WWE before the age of 50 he's turning 47 in just a couple of weeks and he outlined his the rest of this year where he is off to Europe to finish filming head of state then he is going right into peacemaker season two which will take him till around Christmas and then he is hopeful of getting a break from Hollywood so he can do one last run in WWE adding that he's hoping to do that but not uh definitive nor do i think he would be disclosing his uh solid plans but that that looks to be at least in his I idea of come back do i guess a, a run-up to mania next year and then at that point kind of call it a career at least the, the in-ring portion and I, I think he's largely at the finish line in terms of matches as we'll get into in like tonight's show i mean just pretty much a cameo walk on for a quote-unquote match I never buy a wrestler's plans to retire. Um, and I think it's almost foolish to, to even for them to even suggest it. Like I said, I'm going to go until 50. I meant 2050. Yeah. Like the guy will be 60 and he can come in and do his five moves of doom, you know, to, to build one more bench if the company calls him and needs him. So what does one last run mean? Maybe he means something similar to like, you know, this, what, what we just saw with the rock in, in this final boss thing where he would be a c consistent presence leading up to a big match at WrestleMania. Um, sure. Okay. You know, like, I, I guess that qualifies as, you know, one last run, um, because it, it that would require a, lot, a much more of a time investment. But even then when the man is 60, I feel like, um, he would still have some time to do something like that. Friday night rating. So the big programming on uh, Friday was the final four of the women's NCAA tournament. The Iowa Yukon game did 13.9 million viewers. I mean, this game was so popular. Dude, there were people at Ring of Honor that were watching the game as Supercard of Honor was happening. I mean, it has transcended um, sports to just become this cultural event. It certainly has, yeah. Um outside of WrestleMania, I suppose this was um, the, the most talked about sporting event of the weekend. I I would argue this was probably bigger than than Wrestle. The the Sunday game it has the final number is not out yet, but it's going to be around 18, 19 million viewers for the final, which is going to be I mean, we had consistent records broken of the most watched women's game that broke uh, like 
three different times over the last week, mainly through Iowa and Caitlin Clark. But that's what um, SmackDown was up against. The um, they, they were up against first the North Carolina State, South Carolina game for the first half of the show. And then the Iowa UConn game went against the end of SmackDown and Rampage. But SmackDown um, unaffected because they did 2.6 million viewers and over a million In and, the number one oh. show on network programming, and beaten and beat everything except for women's basketball. Okay, I don't know if you just froze partway there, um, or if it was just me, but I, I felt like a a million was left in suspense. But um, that sounds like a big number either way. Okay, um, am I coming in clear here? Yeah, yeah, your audio is fine. Your okay. your your, your video is a bit blurry, but that'll catch it back up. So don't worry. Well. Uh, Rampage, on the other hand, did not have as strong of a performance, falling to 267,000 viewers and a .08. This would be their lowest numbers ever in their normal time slot. So this was going against not just that huge basketball game, but even among the wrestling audience, you're going against um, Super Card of Honor, your own competition, and um, at least the Hall of Fame started at 1030, and with Paul Heyman, no less, that I would think... If there's going to be an audience that's going to be impacted, the Rampage viewership would be that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it just these numbers crashed and they were up against, I would say, their strongest night of uh, competition of the entire year and probably one of the tougher Friday nights that the show has ever had in its history. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you, if you're ROA, uh, AEW, um, if you're Tony Khan, is this how do you interpret this do you react to this at all or is it just business as usual because it's... you end the footage on wednesday for dynamite tune in for part two the extended cut the the zapruder cut on friday night <laughs> rampage sure yes coming up on rampage there was more the cameras were rolling cm punk goes to goes to nando's what did he order and who received the chicken well i order everybody you know if it's a nando's order <laughs> Tony Khan responds. <laughs> so Stardom on um, uh, last last notes here. Stardom has announced the final matches for Utami Hayashishida. She will team with Saya Kamatani against Micah and Saya Ida this coming Friday uh, for her final Stardom match. And it's the same card. Julia will do her farewell, teaming with uh, longtime rival Shuri against Mayu Iwatani and uh, Hanan. And that will be airing on Stardom World. And next week, Rossi Ogawa is going to be holding a press conference with new details about his promotion and kind of the unofficial launch as well. Plenty of discussion and coverage of those news stories coming up later this week as Karen Peterson will be on with WH Park Thursday night for Post Pro Res. So look forward to that. I'm sure they will be discussing this heavily. Um, Stardom running their card last week. And of course, Rossi Ogawa and Julia uh, backstage at SmackDown on Friday. They also appeared on camera at the Stand and Deliver show as well. Well, Rossi Ogawa was showing and then they just panned over to Julia for most of the shot. Rossi Oga, mm. I was I was hoping Booker T was going to give a shout out to all of them, but uh, it was mainly Julia that they focused on. Yeah, uh, a lot's been speculated about WWE's association with this uh, new Rossi Oga, Ogawa promotion. Maybe at this press conference will uh, definitively state whether or not that's the case. Uh, I also find it very fascinating that Julia um, seems to be, you know, she is a free agent now, but is still able to um, not only appear on WWE TV, but still um, uh, able to go back to stardom to finish up her um, run there. And um, well, she's pop- as I understand it, she's actually not under contract any longer. That mm-hmm. was at the end of the month and she was committed to this show. So this is sort gotcha. of the, the, the farewell, but it's not a, like her, you're like she's free and clear now to to work wherever. Similar to the Okada. Um, uh, exactly, yeah, 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 perfect comparison. And finally, tonight, NXT will have a rematch from Stand and Deliver with Braun Breaker and Baron Corbin defending the tag titles against Axiom and Nathan Fraser, and Natalia will appear on the show. Dynamite on Wednesday night in Charleston, West Virginia, headlined by security footage, will also feature Adam Copeland against Penta for the TNT title, a title eliminator bout between... Can Dustin finish the story? against Samoan Joe. That will be uh, one of the matches. Mariah May against Anna Jay. Jericho, Hook, and Katsuyori Shibata against Shane Taylor Promotions, and a segment involving Tony Storm and Thunder Rosa. So that is all. Where where does the security footage run? Do you wait till the end of the show to air it? Do you think it's just thrown in the middle? 
Like, could you, could you end the show with the security footage? I think it depends on how they want to treat the segment. You know, what the segment is intended for. Um, we we know, obviously, there's there's some probably, uh, you know, uh, seeking of vengeance for, for CM Punk's words, um, you know, is probably the main main reason for this. But there's also probably a storyline reason for the Bucks to um, introduce this footage as well. And what is that supposed to lead to? Do we see the return of a Jack Perry? Do we see some other thing? And is that big enough to close the show with? I think that'll ultimately dictate, you know, where the, where, where it's positioned. But uh, more than likely, I'm, I'm going to guess 9 o'clock. All right. We'll find out on Wednesday night, and we will be live right after Dynamite. So uh, check out that. The whole schedule is up at postwrestling.com. Again, we got a really packed week uh, going into UFC 300 week, but a lot of stuff on the cafe uh, towards the latter half of the week, including Rewind Away, where we are chatting the February 18th, 2002 edition of Raw, which features the showdown, the face-to-face between Hulk Hogan and The Rock to set up WrestleMania, and the truck attack that would follow it afterwards where um, hmm. you're left to believe that the rock is clinging to life by the end of this, this show. So all that and more coming up on rewind away this week, but tonight we are chatting about raw from 2024, April 8th to be exact at the Wells Fargo center and man, no Tron. They, they were crowbarring every last human into this building that they could over 18,000 tickets distributed as they had promoted the largest gate in the history of Raw. And I'm curious to see if this is more of a common occurrence that we see. You heard Paul Levesque state when it came to the production side, like we want the people to be seen. We don't want a gigantic stage that is dwarfing people. And I mean, you can you can read, oh, that's, that's so kind of like, they, they want to sell seats. They don't want production kills and they're in a they're in this hot hot period where uh, they can be doing this and the show doesn't suffer one iota we will we will put up monitors so that we can show music videos we do not need this gigantic tron if it means um excess revenue left on the table and and i think it's the ability to promote um you know larger numbers which seem to be all the more important these days whether online or uh with 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 this uh you know with the stock of course so um, I personally don't mind it whatsoever. I, I mean, it's nice to see big impressive sets, you know, whether on TV or, or live, but I think it's just as cool to see a sea of people like tonight, like this show felt like it was a stadium type level crowd, even though it, I mean, 20,000, but 20,000, it looks incredible on TV. One of those among the thousands in attendance was John Cena, who noted uh, to us that the main event taping saw Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark over Katana Chance and Caden Carter in 447 and Ivar beating Julius Creed in 705, which I think would be a pretty entertaining seven minute TV match. And also they did a deal where the lights went down prior to Raw going on the air and playing the song Nightbird by Marty Amato and this very much in the style of the White Rabbit campaign. And later in the show, during a Bronson Reed backstage promo, we had the screen flicker with the word hello appearing. Most are speculating this is probably tied to an Alexa Bliss return or something involving uh, Bo Dallas, but uh, those things were notable. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say more likely Bo Dallas just given the teaser at the end of the Bray Wyatt documentary? Well, the graphic was, um, I mean, it had a very Alexis Bliss kind of a uh, feel to it. But um, huh. yeah, it, it could be it could be both of them. Like mm-hmm. it would make sense that Bo Dallas would be uh, aligned with Alexa Bliss, given the uh, the connections to the character. Um, so in addition, so Russell Tick's last number was 18,348. On the broadcast, they announced 20,248. And they're also pushing over the five days from SmackDown, NXT, WrestleManias and Raw, 201,294. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so now we can just combine shows to like, we're just going to go to greater, uh, greater numbers now. I mean, it's, it's, uh, so 201,294. Paul Levesque starts the show as Cole proclaims, it's the Paul Levesque era. <laughs> I mean, for the guy who is uh, dismissing, this is not the Paul Levesque era. It's our era. I mean, they're really pushing the Paul Levesque era as the terminology. Yeah, we've spoken a lot about this, you know, over the past week or so. But th- th- it's the clear intent um, at-, at their sort of re- branding coming out of this uh, very successful weekend. And 
their 17th consecutive TV sellout that even got its own animation on the show. So that, that's when you know they're mm-hmm. they're all in on these TV sellouts. I'm just curious what will happen when there is a legitimate non. And I'm not talking about they're 200 ticket shy, but it's a clear non sellout. Do do they just quietly drop this? Do they? Because again, your your audience, I think it is um, it's savvy to a degree, but there is also sort of just the. I mean, as as Cody Rhodes has said, if you have the the fact and the legend, print the legend. It's pro wrestling. But I'm just yeah. curious to see how they will handle it when they finally the, when the streak ends. They probably won't mention it, um, and it'll be business as usual. I mean, I think they've already gained an, the enough value out of this entire thing. You know, I I feel like the run up to to WrestleMania and beyond is probably the most important time for for this streak to I guess stay alive. And now that it's kind of past WrestleMania season. You know, whether or not it continues, I I think they already have that value earned. So the crowd is chanting, thank you, Hunter. But he came to thank you, calling it the greatest WrestleMania by every metric imaginable and introduces the man that is going to lead you into the new era, Cody Rhodes. So Cody is out with his championship and Hunter congratulates him on ending one of the most incredible title runs of all time. And then... Paul Levesque notes, look at the gate we drew. I mean, this is just like so this heartfelt moment of, okay, dude, we we made so much money tonight. And they uh, Paul announces that two hours after WrestleMania, the production team called him. They said, hey, we made this video for, for Cody. Uh, do you want to see it? Uh, I love the idea, like the video editors, just to like bask in the glory of this winter. Like, you guys want to just produce a video for fun? <laughs> like, yeah, that's the way this was... Uh, set up not that this was uh, assigned to them just let's just do a video be cool and hunter decided let's air it on raw for cody to see and it's a it's a great video package uh by andra day with rise up but you know that explanation is so specific that i i tend to actually buy it like because what do you really gain from saying you know that versus cody we decided to make a video for you check this out like why the whole preamble of you know two guys that you know really well back at the studio who decided to show uh, uh, make this and and wanted me to show it to you in private, like it that's such a specific story that I tend to believe it. I uh, could be true. It, it could be. Mm-hmm. I, I would think that at the very least, I would think they had this one in the bank rather than the most. Could you imagine these editors after this weekend, exhausted, and the idea of sitting down. And let's let's just maybe it's true. Maybe it's I, totally legit. I can believe it. Like, you know, they're they're artists and sometimes you just you want to do something to to get your emotion out. It really doesn't it doesn't matter at all. It was a really great video. Cody is shown watching it, and I like they had the picture in picture of his reactions to it. And this is shots of him on the independence with Brandy, his return at WrestleMania two years ago, losing last year, and then the ending shot where we see Brandy, we see his daughter Liberty, Dusty, and ends with Cody holding the belt. Like just a really, really well done video package. Mm-hmm. And I do one thousand percent believe that Cody was, was seeing this for the first time. Yes, yes. He has such a great um, face for, like, he's somebody who really does wear his emotion um, on his face really well, which is, I think, like, one of the greatest characteristics you can have as a baby face in professional wrestling. It's the same thing that Flair has. You know, anytime he's, I believe, like, when he retired, they, they, they showed a, a similar video. And, you know, um, he's, if, if the man is emotional, you will be the first to, we all know it, right? And Cody has that very much the same thing. Um, and and it, so it made this little video tribute, I think, um, a wonderful experience for all that, you know, were, were witness to it for the first time. After the video airs, Cody hugs Hunter, and then Hunter gives him the ring, and Cody lays down the belt, kissing it, and asks for Samantha Irvin to announce him again as champion, and she does. I mean, if if there was um, a, a secondary star of the weekend, it might have been Samantha Irvin, who just mm-hmm. got so much praise, rightfully so, right down to Michael Buffer uh, just uh, tweeting about her, her. And that video, I think that's going to be one of the long-lasting memories of that title win, much like Jim Ross 
calling Stone Cold's first title win or some of the legendary calls. This I'm going to I'm not going to remember the call from Michael Cole as much as I'm going to remember Samantha Irvin in tears announcing Cody Rhodes. Like, I think that's going to be the voice, the call of this of what's going to be a very significant title reign in company history that I think will be viewed upon from this date. Very much so, yeah. It's the type of a, um, announcement that you really can't stage. You really can't plan. You can't cue somebody to act emotional, you know, uh, in that particular moment. It, it's, it, it says a lot about, I think, um, just how big that moment was and maybe a, the connection that Cody Rhodes might have with other employees, um, not just, you know, fellow wrestlers, but like people that are in the crew, people that are ring announcers. Uh, and it says a lot about um, Samantha Irvin's, again, very wonderful ability to emote and not be able to you know keep their composure at times when i think it benefits the situation not to cody then speaks about returning two years ago laying out his goals and it became reality last night and acknowledges what roman reigns has done and the crowd starts chanting thank you roman mm -hmm. what a departure here from uh they finally i mean so much of this show was um about speaking beyond the confines of kayfabe you know the entire branding of the paul lebeck era well what the hell does that mean in kayfabe right it's it, it, there's so much of like current modern professional wrestling speaks to who uh, praising the creators and praising the performers beyond their characters and you know this was a moment that they decided to uh much like all the outgoing champions get set that stage so that the audience can show their appreciation for these epic runs that these champions have gone on it says every wrestler has to ask their why why do they do this and he says this is my why and he shows a video of his daughter telling cody to finish the story and he says this is what he does this for for his daughter and for his family that when he goes to work and leaves her he wants his daughter to know that he's going to work in the main event and ends it by stating i am cody rhodes once undesirable became undeniable and now undisputed WWE Universal Champion. Um, I think one of, one of many t-shirts that will probably be coming. Undeniable, undesirable, undisputed. Um, so there we go, the three U's. Yeah, I, I think um, Cody, again, um, this felt like a really nice little town square announcement of the new King's arrival. Um, so often, like usually after WrestleMania, they would do this, but man, sometimes, sometimes like they... The, New champions don't necessarily get a stage as big as this to just gloat and to bask and to celebrate with the crowd. This felt like um, like a pretty substantial celebration for, what, a two-year build. Yeah. Uh, the Rock appears and comes out to the ring, and we got a chant of The Undertaker. Then Rocky sucks, and then asshole. And Rock congratulates the crowd on setting another record for the largest gathering of trailer park trash. And... They cheer as Cody lifts his title and boos as Rock puts his Muhammad Ali People's Championship up in the air. And Rock says how Cody completed his story, beat Reigns in the middle of the ring, but I whipped you like a dog. And mentions having that weightlifting belt for Mama Rhodes and said that by the end of the night, though, when you won the title, Mama Rhodes had a smile on her face just like your daddy in heaven did. And he was my hero, Rock says. And he was friends with Rocky Johnson. He says, I'm not sure if my dad was proud of what I did to you. But that, but that doesn't matter. And he says, Cody, is there any way I can hold your title? I love wrestling belts. I'm a big collector. This is the company to be if you're a belt collector. And says, I've never held that particular belt. And Cody is confused by this request, but agrees as long as he can hold Rock's belt. So the two men do an exchange of titles. So it's like a two foreign diplomats meeting on like neutral ground to exchange gifts at a, uh, a peace meeting and they exchange belts and rock puts it around his shoulder and says this just feels right before handing it back and thanking cody for this rock announces i've got to go away for a while to become mark kerr and the crowd starts chanting and singing goodbye at him but when rock comes back cody i'm coming for you whether you're champion or not Cody says, I'm looking forward to it. As Rock reminds him that 24 hours before you became champion, I beat you. And your story with Roman is over, but our story has just begun. And Cody notes how, Rock, you are my literal boss. You're on the TKO board. And I am your champion. And Rock agrees with this. You are 
my champion. And Rock states as his parting shot, I've got a gift for you. And he reaches into his pocket and passes something along to Cody in his hand that is not revealed. And Cody looks extremely agitated as Rock leaves. And thus concluded a 45 minute commercial free open to Raw between Hunter's entrance and Rock's exit at, at the end of this for our commercial free first hour. And I mean, as clear as day, I mean, Saturday was as clear as day and really the lead up to this show was clear that this match was happening. And the question remains when the match happens. If it's as far off as a year from now, Rock's got like two projects back to back. Um, so it's, I don't think gonna be anytime soon, but laying the groundwork well it's already big enough for a wrestlemania isn't mm -hmm. it you know i mean it was from um the moment that i think they had that uh first um bit of tension at that press conference um it, it immediately um i think in many ways overshadowed the roman reigns versus cody Rhodes program um so it feels like it can't be anywhere but wrestlemania next year if this match is to take place um this was um as is typical now a very long um uh, dwayne johnson segment and I, this was the point, same length of the match on Saturday, <laughs> but I, at this point, uh, not only expect it, I kind of embrace it, especially, you know, considering this was the last time in a while we were going to see this iteration of Dwayne Johnson as the final boss, which has arguably become some of the best work uh, of his entire career. Um, so I, I, I could have used, um, I mean, if they wanted to give me 15 more minutes to top up the hour, I would have been more than appreciative. I thought the scene was really interesting. You know, this felt to me as close to, to, to uh, an attempt at a, a movie scene that you'll see in a professional wrestling, wrestling setting. Um, great tension that was built. I thought Cody's facial expressions did a lot of the communicating for the, for, for, for his part. And I really just marveled at the rocks ability to command a crowd's energy without talking and that was you know conveyed through the entire sort of even before he even really said much of a, a word um before le you know going on to the trailer park trash line uh and then beyond that it not only provided a satisfying end to this current chapter um, the hero has conquered uh, the rock himself you know is is congratulating Cody on doing a giving you a job uh, doing a good job um, but then he also of course teased th their next chapter and um, the uh, the next match that they have and then of course um, it ends with them dangling this sort of big juicy you know what's in the box mystery uh, that will carry itself through I'm sure until mm, next year maybe you know before we get a full-on reveal it felt like a good post credits type of epilogue to set the stage for um their next encounter so i really did enjoy this whole thing maybe it was a um a written contract of like, he was passing him vince mcmahon's class a shares that will vest once cody loses the title to rock it must be it was probably on a usb drive then if that's the case yeah i mean it was, it was very well hidden so. can't really fit that in the palm of somebody's hand I, I've seen some speculation. There's a really popular th thread going on around Reddit right now where um, a poster suggests that it might be a bead from Roman's um, um, necklace re representing the, the tribal chief um, sort of position. Uh, and now they communicated that a match was bloodline rules. We don't exactly know what bloodline rules entails. Uh, and I suppose a theory like this would lead you to think that a bloodline rules match, if you were to beat the, 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 the tribal chief in a bloodline rules match, you become the tribal chief, which would be a really interesting, um, a wrinkle here. Cody Rhodes, um, <laughs> the bloodline presented by prime. Yeah. Cody Rhodes, uh, fresh and off vodka, of vodka and prime <laughs> fuels sure. the bloodline. Uh, Cody Rhodes, fresh off of uh, conquering uh, racism years back, now has gained the title of Tribal Chief of Samoa, the Samoan <laughs> Dynasty, which would be quite the uh, reveal. But I mean, I'm, I, the speculation I think will is is wonderful for us to play around with, and it's the perfect thing to kind of add to to this already hot storyline um, that'll hopefully carry us through for for the rest of the year. Can it ascend to the heights of previous lockbox angles? Um. I don't think that's much of a bar to clear, um, but you know, this is a Paul Levesque led type of mystery that I guess we haven't really seen too much of in this current run yet. 
Also, Cody posted his dates for April. He's listed for every Raw this month. He's also listed for two SmackDowns, including this Friday and the four European dates. And they do confirm, as Hunter had stated over the weekend about the draft coming up shortly, it will be two nights, as usual, starting April 26th on SmackDown and continuing April 29th on Raw. So coming up, um, it will be the week, it'll end the week of Backlash. Okay. And then you would assume everything goes into effect the Monday after backlash mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and, and how loose things are going to be is are Cody and Damian priest going to be separate champions. Cause you could make the argument of, you know, the looser rosters have been to the benefit most for, for at least this latest yeah. run. Um, yeah. It's not even something where you could say, okay, things are going to be different under Paul Levesque. I mean, Levesque has very much been in charge of the past year where he, I think maybe initially after the draft tried to like create pretty like strong lines between the two borders. But as certainly as WrestleMania season, you know, pr- proceeded, it, it became as loose as they were um, under Vince. And one of the, People that is entering the draft is NXT champion Ilya Dragunov, who was in the opening match with Shinsuke Nakamura. And this had a very New New Year's Dash feel to it, where it was unannounced matches, and you pretty much got a surprise in all of them in terms of who was in it or some big, um, you know, it it was all designed for pops for the Mm -hmm. the entrances throughout. And this one being Dragunov, who comes in, and they had a short match. Uh, lands a knee off the turnbuckle and then rolling Germans by Ilya hits the Con- Constantine special and then a leaping boot power bomb and the H bomb to set up the torpedo Moscow. So got in all his key spots Four fifteen, Dragunov gets the win and uh, actually a fairly like subdued Ilya Dragunov on the Dragunov scale. I mean, this was, oh, yeah. um, you know, he was, uh, you know, not, not as emotional as, as usual. He was only like popping like four veins as opposed to like nine. <laughs> Well, it was only a four-minute match, you know. Maybe if The Rock hadn't um, taken up, um, you know, as much time as he. But it wasn't just The Rock. I mean, it was Cody, it was Triple H, and and, and everybody as well. Dude, that that first hour, I think, is it should surpass two million viewers, and it may be even more. Like you have yeah. your two biggest draws in the lead up to this from a television perspective and going for i i would have just sent them out there and be like you guys go as long as you need to we'll yep. we'll, we'll back we'll backstop things mm-hmm. um and, and that was fine then this this was only to be like a quick teaser of Ilya dragonoff this didn't need to be long yeah it wasn't meant to be much other than to say hey keep your eyes on Ilya Ilya dragonoff the nxt champion uh he's also going to be drafted at some point um uh, at the end of this month yeah it, the match was just kind of okay um i almost feel like uh i almost wonder if there's like a better opponent to showcase an uh, uh, dragon off than like uh shinsuke nakamura maybe like him versus like some a uh, larger opponent but uh, he ivar. did when in doubt ivar. yeah ivar yeah although he but, had just worked but you know dragon off versus uh like beating nakamura like does convey that he's at least as good as you know somebody who is maybe at this point more of a mid card mid card or you know or or an upper mid carder in addition to Nakamura. They recap Damian Priest cash in on Drew McIntyre and we have JD Balor and Dominic in the ring to introduce. Um, first, they run down the haters that doubted them and. Rhea and Priest coming out as champions from the show. Dominic introduces Rhea, who gets a big chant and says that WrestleMania was almost perfect. We had some problems to deal with, but two things came out well between herself and Priest. It's a new era for the Judgment Day, and Balor welcomes Damian Priest. So still throwing in there that, you know, we did have problems at WrestleMania and indicating that some people failed at WrestleMania while her and Priest were the ones that lifted things up. So still... I think teasing like the the inner issues among Judgment Day. And also just acknowledging their loss of the tag team titles. Yeah, the tag titles and, and Dominic losing too on, mm-hmm. on the show. They all hug in the center and Rhea, um, Rhea and Damien are referred to as the Terror Twins. Sure, why not? Makes me long for the mix match challenge if we're throwing out uh, names like that. To, the I mean, Terror Twins. Okay. When are these two? When are the Terror Twins going to get to team up? Priest also has a new new uh, entrance theme where, uh, in which he actually does the singing. Oh, he's singing this. Mm-hmm. Okay. They hold up their belts, 
And then our truth appears with his raw tag title out of nowhere. And the place goes wild for this. Truth says, I brought the tag titles back to the Judgment Day. It's gone full circle. And he wants to propose Miz also joining the group. They are just aghast at our truth ruining their moment the miz comes out stating he doesn't want to join judgment day so balor says they're gonna have the shortest reign in history because they want a rematch tonight but truth says we can't there's only three of us and miz is looking they're like what little jimmy and truth proposes a six-man tag against judgment day with the guy that we can't see and Miz says, I want to physically see our partner, but they get jun- jumped by the Judgment Day and takes us into what starts off as a three-on-two handicap match. But this was, I mean, they they set this up that keep keep watching, you know what you're getting. And again, this was teasing something and more importantly, delivering on it instead of just a uh, a, a tease and leaving the crowd unhappy. Se- seems like a, a great strategy, but not one we would always see implemented. Mm. So the six-man... Um, Pat McAfee refers to Dominic as a dude wipe after you wipe. Cole also, um, yeah, he talks about the WrestleMania viewership increase, and then they get the advantage on Miz after he is sent to the floor. After the break, JD is in control, and then Cena's music plays, so the place goes nuts, and John Cena just comical in terms of his facial reactions here as he gets the hot tag shoulder blocks onto jd and then we get all three delivering slams five knuckle shuffles and a three person aa onto the three and a triple pin in 10 minutes and four seconds for a very entertaining uh, spectacle here for the show and fine use of john cena for about 90 seconds really nice cameo for the surprise of the um, I, what I think might be expected out of a Raw after WrestleMania and certainly does add to the star power of a show like this and um, gives our truth a big uh, a childhood dream type of moment. This whole show was about just giving the audience all this cool stuff. Like that was the whole three hours was just shouldn't delivering. Every, shouldn't every show be that? Uh, I mean, it's it, it's an idea, but I mean... All I could think about was the amount of heat that was like left on the table for so many segments here. Mm. Imagine if John Cena didn't show up. Man, the Judgment Day would be so hated, right? Right. Yeah. Mm. Then we go to Bronson Reed after winning the Andre Battle Royal, and he cuts a promo uh, because he's going to be in a fatal four-way tonight with Jey Uso, Ricochet, and Drew McIntyre to determine the next uh, contender for the World Heavyweight Championship. And this is where we get the uh, the screen glitch. Um, that was our on-screen tease of uh whoever this is going to be smackdown ad all they promoted was cody rhodes will be on the show as will bailey in detroit this friday dominic and Rhea are backstage and dominic didn't think cena was going to show up he's still in the old era Rhea says that dominic put faith in andrade and he was betrayed and dominic says i'm gonna go speak to adam pierce and he is not out of the shot like a second before a chair nails Rhea in the head and somehow Dominic has like missed this, like his back is turned and he doesn't notice this commotion because he doesn't return until like two minutes later. And it's Liv Morgan throwing this chair and attacking Ripley aggressively. And then Dominic returns and they do a pull apart with the officials. And Dominic, this is our cool production moment of the night. He swats the camera and tells them to go away. So the camera turns and just enters the arena. And it's one long continuous shot from backstage through the arena, through the crowd, into the ring for Indy Hartwell, who is already in the ring for her match with, with her opponent. Um, it was it was cool. It was very cool. Yeah, another really well done sort of um, connecting shot between something that happens backstage to what's uh, in the ring right now. Um, you know, the chair shot came as a big surprise, I'm sure, to uh, everybody at home and maybe even to Rhea Ripley as well. This was a... Uh, I wonder if it does. This look like it looked like it nailed. Like it almost felt like she was to get her hand up and hit. How do you you get your hand up when it's to your side? You know, like it's they do this thing where okay, we can't do unprotected chair shots anymore, so we will throw the chairs as hard as possible against guys. But usually, people are able to get their hands up. In this case, uh, Rhea was not able to. So I would. I, I wonder if this was really a necessary risk. Nonetheless, um, even the the fact that we're having this conversation, I think, is a, of a benefit to Liv's current character. You know, this sort of uh, very unhinged version of her that is just incredibly vengeful and at a different level than what we, we, we are used to seeing her as. I really continue to like her increased aggression. 
and I'm very excited to see the continued evolution of this character. Yeah, it's all, it's always a fun post WrestleMania program. The I didn't get booked at WrestleMania anger that fuels them. Well, she's fueled just by uh, Rhea taking her out for all those months too. Roxanne Perez is revealed as the opponent for Indy Hartwell, the NXT Women's Champion. Now, I don't think they specifically stated she was in the draft. Um, no, I don't think so. No, but um, Perez goes after Indy's leg, and then Candice trips Perez, and Indy sees it. The official does not, and Indy is arguing with Candice on the apron as Perez then rakes the eye and hits her with the Pop Rocks to win in 245, and it's Candice telling Indy, I told you so, and it seems like we're going to continue this until Indy probably finally aligns with Candice LeRae and we get some heel team out of this. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, I, I thought Roxanne, like her heelish attitude looked really good here. She looks very confident as a character. She really does to me feel main roster ready, though it probably won't hurt her to have like a tuttle rain on top as a heel for at least a little, little while longer down in NXT. Uh, but she, I thought, looked really good here on this big stage. I, I totally think she could make the jump and I think is would would fit in very well on either roster. Sami Zayn with his new shirt. Yo, Khadija, I did it. Can you imagine how many of these are going to sell next week in Montreal? And probably in many cities. Probably plenty, yeah. Mm -hmm. The crowd is singing along with his theme, and he puts over Gunther as the greatest intercontinental champion of all time and said he got help from the fans when he doubted himself, as well as being with his wife and son right before the match and his brother Kevin Owens giving him the encouragement as he walked out but it says there's also one more person i need to mention but before he can bring up that person's name he's interrupted by ludwig kaiser and giovanni vinci and kaiser says you're the icy champion you look like all these peasants like a bum after all the great work gunther did for that belt and they surround the ring and then chad gable runs out and would set up our impromptu tag match uh, before the match begins though we got a vignette for sheamus who has been out since that match with Edge in Toronto last August. It's been an extremely long, like, think about that. Adam Copeland has had multiple title runs in AEW since Sheamus last wrestled. So um, coming at some point, maybe they'll hold him off until the draft. You would think so. I mean, maybe the week prior, just to kind of remind people, um, hey, this is Sheamus. Which brand is he going to go to? But th either one. Yeah. Did you catch the line right after this vignette aired and – Michael Cole said something like, you know what that means? And Pat McAfee yells, the, it's fight night. And Michael Cole responds, I really hope I don't have to say that anymore. Yeah, I did notice that. Cole is extremely entertaining when you are just listening super closely. And I mean, this man has just, um, <laughs> he feels so free on these broadcasts. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sami Zayn and Chad Gable against Vinci and Kaiser. Uh, good match here. I would say this was a... Uh, you know, um, probably the best match on the show, like in terms of just like uh, bell to bell. And I really enjoyed Zayn and Gable as a team here. I don't think they're probably going to explore them as a team, but um, they were really great here. And Vinci and Kaiser, they're great for this kind of a role as sort of your your stand-ins for, for Gunther. Gable is suplexing both men in the ring, landed a cannonball off the apron, and then the diving headbutt before a chaos theory, but the tag is made, so they hit the Imperial Bomb. Zayn is in for the save, and Gable stops a second Imperial Bomb, and Kaiser come, comes off with a leaping uppercut, but Gable catches him in midair into a German suplex. Great sequence. And then Zayn and Gable do dueling, rolling Germans, three of them each, and Zayn applies the ankle lock, that Gable has taught him, but then Kaiser yanks Gable to the floor, breaks up the submission, and Zayn lands the exploder, is setting up for the Haluva kick, but he tags in Gable so that he can get the victory, hits the Haluva, and then a chaos theory. Gable pins Vinci in 12 minutes and 21 seconds. Really good match, I thought. You know, a lot of the focus in this one actually was on making Gable shine, and I think they're doing their best to keep Chad Gable um, alive as a relevant character, despite not being at WrestleMania, um, not even accompanying Zayn you know, or playing into the finish at WrestleMania. Um, this, though, however, uh, obviously built him up for that tag, uh, the title match next week. And uh, in some ways, I thought like Gable was even positioned as almost a superior competitor to Sami Zayn by you know being his coach and being the one to get the pin. Jey Uso did a promo tonight. It's going to be a yeet down in this fatal four-way. 
Pierce and Nick Aldis are with NXT general manager Ava. And so they shake hands and Aldis notes, great job signing Andrade. And I'm just thinking, like, they've just completed all these signings, like Braun Breaker and Jade Cargill getting signed to SmackDown and Andrade just signing with Raw. It's like, are all these people now up for grabs in the draft? Like, what have you... That's what, what, the indication. Did you sign them to, like, what, a three-week contract and then you're uh, technically a free agent? Yeah, I know. It, I, I mean, all this basically said it right here, you know, that Andrade is up for grabs. Um, So you would expect the same with Braun and Jade. So... What really was the point? Um, it was like weeks, months of negotiations in the case of Jade. Yeah. Um, but anyway. Well, let's... maybe they should make a rule that says, like, uh, we signed you to a one-year contract. You can't, you're not el el eligible to be drafted. Ava just reiterates that, um, well, not just that we could see NXT talent in the draft. She specifically stated that some people could be going to NXT in the draft hmm. as well. Very so it looks as though it's going to be a draft involving all three brands drafting talent rather than just one way traffic of NXT talent leaving. Yeah. And how do they, um, how do they kind of um, pos position that within the draft itself? You know, does NXT get an equal number of picks in order as one of the other brands? Um, I mean, in years past, they would give raw more picks than the other more than likely. I'm guessing they'll just announce a set of drafts, you know, in, 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 in various tiers and just, not really, you know. It's one that I, I'm curious thing. to see how the presentation is. It's uh, like how many members of the roster are it's going to be? Oh, sweet! I'm going to NXT. Like what yeah. a gr what a great uh, step up for me. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe maybe they should say all the undrafted talent goes to NXT, and that and then Odyssey Jones will have a uh, a, a place to be. That would be a lot of people in NXT. Usually, a lot of people get undrafted. Yeah. Chelsea Green walks in. She complains about not being included at WrestleMania. And she's going to contact the top brass. And they said that they made a match for her tonight as a collaboration between Raw and SmackDown. So she's excited and is sent to the ring to find out who her opponent is going to be. And this is when we got a graphic of all the different TV sellouts and the cities that they have hit over the lead up to Mania and coming out of it. And Chelsea is in the ring as Jade Cargill's music plays. And they kept this one short and sweet with Green screaming that she did not agree to this and turns into a pump kick. And then she is lifted for Jaded. I will say this about Chelsea Green. She had like two minutes of TV time, including the backstage segment. And she used this for all it was worth. And her screaming at the top of her lungs before Jaded was hit, I thought like made this. It goes 33 seconds, all it needed to be. Uh, Jade just gets a dominant win. But I, like a lot of people were just praising like Chelsea Green making the most out of the least in terms of what she had on this show. And it was, uh, you know, fine, fine for what it was. This is what the crowd wanted to see out of Jade Cargill, just big spot and wins dominantly. Oh, Chelsea, I think, is, is um, an excellent performer. I, I, I think in many ways you can't ask for a better person to be in this sort of like Jester's role for the division. I think she she is incredibly valuable. Might not get necessarily get a match on WrestleMania, but on TV you'll probably see plenty of her. And for good reason. She's really excellent in, in here. Um, this is a different platform for Jade, you know? Like even though she's already on the roster, um, I think... Putting her as a surprise in a featured role on a Raw after WrestleMania, um, it continues to tell everybody that this this person is a really big deal. Sami Zayn catches up with Alpha Academy and wants to speak with Chad Gable alone, and says, "You know, you had mentioned that I owe you one, and um, I think we're even after I tagged you in at the end of the match tonight." Gable's like, "What?" And Zayn is only joking. He says, I know you want this belt. So he wants to defend it against him next week in Montreal. And that is going to be the match. So not Bronson Reed in Montreal, but instead Chad Gable um, for mm -hmm. the IC title next week. And this will be interesting. I, I'm i very curious to see how how big this match is over the next week in terms of... Uh, uh, it, it's been like a week since I looked at the number, but they were like over 9,000 tickets out and the Bell Center is a big building and mm. this should be like the main event of the show in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Do you, so you think the is the streak being threatened by the It Montreal depends what the setup threat? is for the Bell Center. Like the Bell Center, I don't know how big they can get it for for wrestling, but they can well, I, What was it for Elimination Chamber? 
I'd have to look it up, but if you, uh, yeah, I, I can look that up as we're. Uh, yeah, I think the uh, the booking of this one will be really interesting. You know, obviously it's double babyface, uh, but it is Sammy in Montreal. So, um, will, will they boo Chad Gable? I don't think so. I think, um, you know, Chad Gable is is the sort of um type of uh, wrestler that will uh, er, have the respect of the Montreal crowd, but they will certainly be more in favor of a uh, Sami Zayn winning. Uh, but I also think it's very likely that this somehow leads to Bronson Reed versus Sami Zayn. So um, I would expect Zayn to retain with perhaps some interaction for Bronson Reed leading to that finish. I also don't think this will be the end of this particular chapter with Sami Zayn and Chad Gable. Um, the, the, the future of this program will more than likely be um, these two opposing each other, one as a heel, one as a baby face. And at this point, might might be more likely to, to, to see a Chad Gable as a heel. But you know what? They could carry on this double babyface interaction for quite a while too. I think you go with like they're they're, you know, double babyfaces here. Sammy's obviously the hometown favorite next week, but they have a hot match that Zayn wins, and it's Gable being frustrated that he got pinned by this guy again, and that can fuel a turn at some point. It doesn't have to be immediate, but I think that is. I don't, I don't think we're getting one match uh, out of this thing. For Elimination Chamber last year, for the pay-per-view, they did SmackDown on the Friday and then Chamber on the Saturday night. They did 14,651 and 13,807 paid, uh, according to the Observer, last year. So that is kind of what we're, lo we're looking at in terms of w with their setup. But again, they are also flexible with the, the size of their set. And if there's that extra demand, I'm sure they will make room. Then it was Drew McIntyre coming out ahead of the four-way main event, and he gets on the microphone, which has now become a highlight of these shows, and calls it BS what happened last night. I was champion for five minutes and 46 seconds, which is longer than most of you last in bed. The crowd did not like this, this accusation. He says, Seth Rollins, I don't like you, but I respect you for going out on your shield like a warrior. And uh, it has been reported by Dave Meltzer that Rollins looks to be out for at least a couple of weeks just dealing with his knee injury um, that I'm sure he was, it, despite last week stating that he was at full strength, um, probably still dealing with the effects of that. Um, but at least as of now, it's being reported he won't be out too long and was absent from television on Monday night. And Drew clearly in. Clearly appears to be in, yes. Mm. And Drew... Then refers to Damian Priest as the bondage undertaker who screwed everything up on Sunday. Calls money in the bank a joke. It's twice cost me my belt. Damian Priest stole it from me. Damian, you're only a transitional champion because that belt belongs to me. And the real cause of everything on Sunday was that prick CM Punk, who's a coward, sweeping my leg after I had turned my back and said, Punk, when you're ready, I'm going for the weakest part of your body. And it just so happens your entire body is the weakest part. <laughs> I mean, Drew was great here. I mm -hmm. thought this was one of the highlights of the show. This was the most maybe pissed off in a long time we've seen a Drew McIntyre. And I mean, you know, after losing a title to Money in the Bank cash, and he, he really needed to be, uh, he was just absolutely, absolutely great. Some great lines here. Uh, did take the time to put over the outgoing champ, which again, they yep. did in every single um, segment uh, between right. Sammy, between Cody, and between Drew here. Uh, gave that spotlight for, you know, the outgoing champions. And um, set up the Priest rematch here, as well as uh, continued heating up the Punk program. So um, still a lot on the horizon for Drew. Uh, and you can at least expect him to, you know, stick around probably. Um, well, I guess no reporting about whether or not he signed a new contract yet. But I, I, I would say it's almost surely a lock. He stays until Clash of the Castle. Yeah, wh whether, whether Penn has been put to paper, I think everyone would be floored if this was not. Uh, mm. and, and not like it just w would seem that like this guy is having the run of his lifetime. And there's always, there's always a point in your career where it's probably good to take that, that break, even if you don't want to go elsewhere, just to mentally recharge. I would strongly argue now is not that time for, for, for Drew. So we have Ricochet, Bronson Reed, Jay Uso, and Drew McIntyre. Winner gets the next world heavyweight title shot. They didn't specifically state if this will be a backlash in France, although I think most would presume that to be the case when the show is only a couple of weeks away. 
There's a table set up in the corner. Bronson puts Jay through that table. Reed and Drew then square off with chops, and Drew manages a Michinoku driver onto Bronson Reed, which looked impressive. Ricochet and Jay are in with double super kicks on Drew. Then Reed joins them for tr a triple uh, set of super kicks on Drew McIntyre before Jay and Ricochet take out Bronson. Jay spears Bronson. Drew's in the save, makes the save, and all four men are down. Then uh, Reed hits a DVD and Senton climbs to the top for the tsunami, which Drew yanks at him to stop. And they go to the floor. The desk gets cleared, and Bronson Reed is placed on the desk, and he's just laying there. Jay gets stopped on top with an Inzaguri by Ricochet, and Ricochet climbs with a springboard 450, putting Bronson Reed through the desk. Definitely the most impressive spot on the entire show. And he uh, also looks uh, clearly looked at Samantha before doing it and said, I'm sorry, before proceeding. Oh, did he? Okay. Yes. Well, that was, it was incredible looking. And Drew and Jey Uso are left alone. Jey Uso is selling the ribs, which are taped up from the night prior and the spear off the stage to Jimmy Uso. And he gets hit with the Future Shock DDT. And as Drew sets up for the Claymore, CM Punk appears ringside, grabbing Drew's leg. And this allows Jay to spear Drew and hit the Uso splash to win in 1739. Um, another strong match i would say this and the tag earlier were the standout matches and with damian priest as champion it can allow you to go with a challenger that is uh, you could at least you can get by with a challenger at the level of a jay uso for a one month uh program to build things up but jay uso will get the title shot date to be determined i would suspect france but that was the conclusion of the show and drew gets screwed again yeah yeah I mean, this match for me, uh, so much of it was filled with commercial breaks because they had to make up for the first hour. So I, it didn't really hit for me. Um, so, but the, the Raw after, after Mania, I think, is rarely about the in-ring matches. It's it's about, you know, the surprise appearances. It's about the promos. It's about the celebrations. And it's about the jumping on, off points to uh, future programs. And I thought all of that was, like, pretty well, like, very well established in many cases uh, on, on, on this show. Um the rock paul Levesque, cody rhodes first 45 minutes of this entire thing they were long but they were also deservingly long because this really did need to feel like the beginning of a new chapter or at least a, an epilogue to you know a years long story that they've been building several years long story that they've been building with this cody rhodes roman reigns storyline um also a setup of course for next year and then after that you know you you had some surprises in the form of the, your NXT uh, champions appearing on the show. Um, I do also see them maybe saving a lot more of those big announcements of call-ups for the draft that's coming up uh, a month from now. Or, um, but, you know, you got a Cena cameo here. So I, I, I feel very satisfied for a Raw after WrestleMania. I... I thought this was as far removed from last year's Raw After Mania, which was the infamous show that uh, Vince McMahon was backstage for and just was a, it was just a disastrous show. I mean, one of the lowest ranked shows in Raw's history on Cage Match. I mean, just such a, such a sour note that I think had just taken this show to such a level that tonight was, or Monday was all about sort of rebuilding the, Raw after Mania as a thing, tons of fan service, tons of surprises, just like a feel good show too. It's like we weren't, we weren't going to do any heavy angles. This was all about letting the crowd go nuts and surprising them, and pretty much just a celebratory three hour night after an ultra successful weekend for the company and setting a lot up. Like as I came out of this show, and the big thing is Rock and Cody. Like I do feel like for maximum value probably should be the match at mania next year and mm -hmm. that being that's the program for your netflix launch to lead up to next year's wrestlemania which will be the first year that they have the netflix uh, effect to build up wrestlemania and could you ask for a better match to market um than mm -hmm. rock and cody um that that would be the direction i'd go and if you get cena for like one for a big mania program like you could have that as well next year well, the big question is um, what what rock schedule will allow, you know, if he happens to have this window available next year, then yeah, you could do it. But if he happens to be booked for a movie, maybe this will have to be a SummerSlam program. You know, Rock versus Roman is also a match that's out there. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll probably learn a lot more about that once we know what when Roman might come back and, 
you know. Um, but but that's also a story that they've teased as well. Maybe battle, the the battle for the bead. Battle for the bead. Is that what you would call the pay per view? I mean, battle for the bead. You know, you go from finish the story, <laughs> battle for the bead. I mean, what what could be better? You know how many of those things are going to sell? Those the necklaces, the bead necklaces. I wonder if they even sell them. I mean, why why would I? I never that? see them anywhere. They should be selling those. Hmm. You could throw a fifty dollar price tag on it. Um, I suppose so. Now, is that offensive? Like, you know, is is there some sort of um, like a sacred thing about it that that exists in real Samoan tradition that maybe forbids something like that? You know, I, I'm sure they would get over that very quickly. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, once they <laughs> they get that royalty check. Uh, we have a number of super chats here, and uh, I want to first of all go to this one from Preet. Who sends fifty dollars? Preet says it was so great meeting you two at the meetup. I've been listening to you guys in some form or fashion over the a decade now, so it was a real long time listener, first time caller moment. Keep up the great work and a big espresso martini. Cheers! Thank you so much, Preet. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and thank you for showing up to our Drinkers Pub beat up with us in Poison Rana and pretty much the entire, well, most of the you know post wrestling uh, hosts were were there as well. It was it was a really fun time. That was um, those are always my favorite parts of these uh, these trips. And this one was it was great to meet so many people from all different parts of the world um, that had uh, showing up for that. So a great turnout, and it was great to meet so many of you. I I couldn't believe when I looked out, it was like it was already like we had scheduled it for two hours, and it was all of a sudden it was like four thirty. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thank you the so time, much. Time like Preet. flew by. Yeah, yeah, for that support. Um, and yes, uh, espresso martinis were enjoyed. At Drinker's Pub. Uh, let's go to Ryan G, who sends $15. Thank you, Ryan. He says, thanks for all the great coverage this weekend. What is the level of interest in White Rabbit 2.0? wanted to ask you, Way, because you were as engaged with that campaign as, as anyone. Even Not even so much like your interest, but doing something that leans on that style, but also is kind of its own thing, uh, too. Are you, I, I'm sure you're intrigued by this and how they executed yeah. a second time around. It was a very successful l- relaunch of the Bray Wyatt character in 2022. I think the whole campaign with all its Easter eggs and, and, um, HTML codes and, you know, coordinates and all that, that was some of the most engaged, uh, I've been as a fan and, uh, I, some of the most engaged I've seen, um, a, an online fan base, so um, this presents an opportunity to do it again. I am excited for the 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 you know um, the hunt. I am not as excited about a Bo Dallas return because I don't think he's the level of performer that a Bray Wyatt has is. So um, like, what's at the end of all of this is not as enticing for me. Now you can also maybe argue like, has did Bo Dallas ever receive like his proper um. I guess opportunity, you know, on the main roster. Um, it's debatable, but um, the end result of it, I'm not as excited by, but I am very excited by um, the storytelling. And I think this, this, this run will take on a, a whole different meaning because of the, mm, I guess, um, sort of um, mm, tribute aspect of it to, to a Bray Wyatt, you know, the, the sort of lingering um, specter of uh Wyndham Rotunda kind of like overseeing the, this entire story this time. So I'm 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 very open to it. Again, not ex- excited for maybe some of the matches or like um just even arrival of of a Bo Dallas in this form, but they could change my mind. You know, they could change anybody's mind I think with the proper story. Let's go. Thank you very much Ryan for for the for that Thank super you, Ryan. chat. Let's go up next to Jake from the Windy City who sends five bucks. Thank you, Jake. He says, thanks as always for the great coverage. I'm surprised they haven't announced the location for Mania 41 yet. They would usually announce by this time. Um, not just by this time. I was looking at this. Just I was curious when they announced Philadelphia. That was the summer of 2022 that they announced. So we're, we're talking almost like two years in advance. They had the Philadelphia one. And prior to that, if you remember, they announced like three years in a row of locations. I would imagine that an announcement is imminent because people are now is the time that people are already earmarking their travel plans for next year. So this is very late in the game by WWE standards for a WrestleMania announcement. I was thinking Sunday night made all the sense in the world to reveal it. But again, there is probably more to it than that. I mean, of just 
whether it's finalizing the agreement or they have some kind of rollout um, for maximum interest, I would think that an announcement is probably imminent um, mm. for next year's location. Thank you, Jake. Uh, producer Ray. Two-way two, uh, Ray. Two-way two Ray? Is that the nickname now? Two-way Ray. Great work as always, gents. Hope you both have your, gained your bearings after a hectic week. Yeah. I, um, thank you, Ray. And I hope you rest up ahead of this week's edition of the NWA podcast. He's got a busy weekend. He's got UFC 300 and then the NWA podcast Sunday night. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ray, for your support. And uh, check out the NWA podcast this Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern time, I think is the usual time they go live. So um, set, set aside seven hours. Uh, I, I think night. they'll get it through uh, 30 minutes. I think I think they'll get through. <laughs> There's a lot night. for them to catch up on. Uh, lastly, let's go to Graham who sends five dollars, and he says great coverage this past weekend. Thank you so much, Graham, for just simply sending a super chat. No question, you would just want to say thanks. Thank you very much, Graham, and all of you uh, for for your coverage and people that uh, supported the Post Wrestling Cafe. We had a lot of bonus coverage throughout the weekend, including uh, Kate from Montreal giving her thoughts on a lot of the the non WrestleMania matches going on, which there was a ton this past weekend, and then show reports from WH Park. From John Ceno, uh, the Poison Rana crew were filming their road diaries. Um, mm -hmm. I finally listened to uh, Davey's show about his... He had told me in person about his plane ride. Dude, it was frightening. Absolutely frightening. I, I would... Uh, uh, I'm glad everything turned out okay for him and his yeah. uh, trip to New York. And I hope his return was a lot less uh, stressful. I hope so, too. I hope everybody got home safe, uh, including all of, all of you guys who, who listened to the show and might have made the trip... Um, uh, WrestleMania weekends are always, um, at this point, very overwhelming, um, but a, a lot of fun. Like, there's no other experience that you can have as, as a wrestling fan that could be all consuming like that. Uh, at, you want to go to forum.postwrestling.com? For yeah, some? we got a few pieces yeah. here. We'll start off with Muggin. This time a year ago, it felt like Raw after Mania had jumped the shark, but that was last year. Cody started his new chapter on top of the world as well as Judgment Day. The Rock bowed out, but not without a warning shot. There was no Seth, Becky, or Roman, and Raw didn't suffer one iota thanks to the depth of its roster. Seeing Roxy and Ilya was dope, and I love that NXT is going to be involved in the upcoming draft. It was an entertaining show with the four-way being the standout. Drew can't catch a break, can he? This felt like a clean slate. I bet Roman will get voted off the island on Friday. Well, they haven't announced Roman's uh, appearance. They've announced Cody no. being there. No. I wonder if we'll see Roman at all um, in this, you know, post-WrestleMania. I like the idea of him just disappearing, and it's, and it's left for this question of how will he return and yeah I, I i don't think you need him on the show at the moment i think it's more mm -hmm. impactful that he goes away for a long time and then when you're ready to do a program that's when he comes back and it should be a months you you will presumably see jimmy and solo react to the loss and and maybe they will give maybe paul Heyman as well you know they'll be there to give us some indication of like how the tribal chief might be feeling um that and, and like I the group goes forward the, much like you know dx after sean disappears it's like they continue the group in their um their iteration of it and maybe they double down if you are bringing in new members mm -hmm. and then again it's roman reigns of like how is he responding to like his leadership being usurped uh the rock like kind of dismissing him like your story is done you were beaten um th there's a lot there for them to have and this is sort of a, like the new chapter for for the roman reigns character and do we see any indication of like cody's direction for backlash you know now that he, he is probably going to stay on us on a smackdown i think you would want to like i would think by friday you want to at least tease that because it's a few weeks and obviously on the raw side like there was nothing set up for cody and i would mm -hmm. imagine that's because he probably has a smackdown program going into france mm -hmm. Uh, let's go to Cameron from Bristol, UK, who's a new patron. Welcome, Cameron. Welcome to the Polovec era. I lo love this, unlike last year. It didn't rely on complete nostalgia. We have NXT call-ups and new stories felt like how Hunter would refresh NXT. The opening segment went a little, little long, but it pushed home the emotional title win and carried on the momentum from night two. Gable and Sammy is a great combo, and I can't wait for them to pay off next week. It will slap. Bet. Uh, Ilya and Roxy debuting before being drafted is a great idea and both got a decent enough reaction. Debuting them in front of a crowd was smart. In front of big, a big crowd was smart. The crowd stayed hot. Why? No women's tag title match. Replace it with a mid-card title and start again. The tag titles have had too much poor booking. Time to push the individual mid-card. Yeah, um, I, 
I think you maybe at this point like you might have enough character well you might have enough characters to suggest um a, a mid card NXT uh sorry a, a mid card WWE Women's Championship um but then I think back to the past year and maybe the answer is no they don't have enough uh in NXT you do because there are I feel like just as th there's just as much airtime for the women as men in and NXT. they don't even have tag titles anymore in NXT mm-hmm but on the main roster, like the women still get a very disproportional uh, amount of air time. Um, so I, I, I don't think there's any issue with like having tag team championships. Um, you just have to treat them well. You just have to, you know, d dedicate enough story and, and air time to them to to prop them up. Um, so I don't s simply think exchanging it for a mid card title would be any sort of answer if the air time and the quality and attention is the same. Last one goes to Alex Francois, who says he just wanted to share a thought on the weekend as a whole. For my first WrestleMania weekend experience, it was incredible to see it firsthand, not just the shows, but the atmosphere in Philadelphia was incredible. Thanks for taking the time to chat with me and my wife at Drinker's Pub, and I know you guys were super busy. It was a great way to start our last-minute decision to go to night two. Uh, well, we hope you enjoyed the, uh, the second night of the show as well. It's interesting to see the... Obviously, I thought like night two is going to be the more well-remembered of the two nights. And of course, it had the big Cody moment that was so significant and this huge payoff to the, you know, the end of the Reigns title win or title reign and Cody winning. I would say, though, like night one, I think I think the biggest negatives are it was a long show. You had the weather. Um, but honestly, like I thought night one, like. The, the Zane Gunther match to me was still probably my favorite match of the two nights. Like it wasn't the moment of the night, which was the Cody celebration that I think was the the ultimate um, takeaway from the weekend. But I just think the night one show it was uh, like almost like not panned, but just uh, I, I'm surprised there was like such a disparity in it because I thought the night one show was just from like wrestling quality between Becky and Rhea and Sammy and Gunther and. Even the main event, yes, too long, but I would say for those final 15 minutes were incredibly strong. You might have people just simply prioritizing the emotional high of, mm -hmm. uh, of, a, of you know, like a season finale moment, like, you know, the, mm -hmm. the Cody win over, over Roman, over whatever match quality that even a Sammy versus Gunther was able to provide. Um, you also had, you know, a cash in. Uh, successfully w with um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Damian Priest as well. That and, and Bailey and Yo, I think, really over delivered from the build up to what the match was at the end. Like night two was a really great show, and it was, I would say, the better produced show. Like there was less downtime, and it was um, much more manageable show, just in, in that sense. And of course, peaked with the, the the ending as well. But yeah, if you combine the two, like I think, I think this was one of the stronger wrestlemanias like especially of like the two night versions like we haven't had like duds of these like two night events i think the general belief is like the two nights so superior to the one yeah yeah um unless you're that, there live and have to get out of a stadium each night i i think as a viewing experience yeah i prefer like w what we've been having now how much of that is just simply down to like the product being hot and the storytelling being better and you know that that alone versus no, it was it was a big factor on, on top of it but i would state even going back the last number of years i mean um like dallas was you had you had you had some really great stuff there last year you had the big um owens and zane tag title wins it seems as though like i just think the two nights are so much more manageable my question to you as we end things off of our wrestlemania coverage has waiting attended his final wrestlemania it's at least um, a worthy question to ask. I mean, maybe ask me next year. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, at, how at how did you enjoy the the differences of you got the live experience and you got the broadcast experience? I kind of I kind of got the broadcast experience both nights. That's true. That's true. You like did, in you the did. press box, we were just watching on TV. It wasn't right. really a live experience. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's a, that is a good point. Well. That is going to bring an end to uh, this Tuesday edition of Rewind to Raw. Up tonight, Braden Harrington and Davey Portman are going to be here on the channel with Up Next immediately after the post Stand and Deliver edition of NXT. So tune in for that. Wednesday, I'll be with Brandon Thurston at 3 Eastern, and we're going to be going over a lot of the key business stuff from WrestleMania weekend and looking at the whole handling of sort of Vince McMahon, who was the overshadowing figure i would say of both nights of wrestlemania in terms of its um of its 
presentation and the message that was conveyed by the company. Stephanie McMahon uh, showing up on the second night also noted that um, someone had shared with me that they had seen Linda McMahon at the show on Sunday and uh, Gabriel Iglesias uh, posted a photo with Linda McMahon. So, I mean, she was there as well uh, in the background uh, on top of things. That's a very strange um, uh, sentence that that you just said yeah uh, fluffy an, fluffy gets a photo with uh yeah. linda mcmahon to of an interaction her, right. her attendance yeah it's a wrestlemania moment um I, i'm sorry i missed it out out on yeah imagine what reaction would linda mcmahon have gotten if she had come out to start off night two um maybe maybe a she, more, she is more of a political figure now than she is a professional wrestling figure true yeah um but I, I, I maybe still met with like, you know, similar reaction to to Stephanie, I guess. Well, there you have it. The uh, the McMahon status. We'll talk about that, too, on Wednesday. And then Wayne and I are back Wednesday night with Rewind to Dynamite. Whole schedule, postwrestling.com. And again, postwrestlingcafe.com. $6 gets you 30 days of access. All of our extra shows, including Rewind Away, the whole archive of 153 editions of Rewind Away. And for Double Double Espresso patrons uh multiple audio news updates from me which i will be getting back into this week as well now that i'm back in town and can uh focus on those too so big thank you to everybody that we got to see in philadelphia over the weekend a huge thank you to the whole member of uh, the whole members of the post wrestling family including andrew thompson jack went on john kleinchester john pine and everyone that was out there in philadelphia wh park rich fan john Cena, Braden, davey Got to sit, hang out with B Detroit, Jesse from the Six, who was off to Washington. Uh, the whole the whole crew was out in Philadelphia. Almost, almost. Our man Neil, the the no. the the Godfather of post wrestling. Well, thanks to Jordan and uh, uh, his fiance Lily, um, we we did have a, a nice little shrine built <laughs> dedicated to Neil Flanagan. So he was present for all of our trips to the Rocky Steps and uh, all throughout the city as well. I've I've figured out how how we, we need to hang out with, with Neil. We need to go to him. Oh, we tra- okay. We travel to him. Uh, maybe, a, maybe a future show. Um, all in. You want to go? Okay, let's go. All right. Okay. Well, well, we'll talk about it off here. All right. That's it for us. Thanks, everyone. And we will speak with you on Wednesday.